Well, that's the quarterly calendar. Um, so, as Ian said, he was making his living out of doing this. So the object was to sell calendars to people and the photographs slipped in there. And uh, the ones that weren't sold are the ones that are sitting in boxes like that in the library here. Um, the way this project started was um, that I was taking a local history walk through Fairfield where we live and uh, as part of the research for it I came across four photos online um, and on Pitch Queensland uh, from the Corley collection. So uh, after that walk I came with my friend Robert Perry down the back to the library here and we met Stephanie Ryan who said, um, uh, oh yes, there's you know, a lot more than that. So um, we went up to the John Oxley Library and uh, found these boxes and boxes of, um, of photographs. Um, there's a typical one and what I like most about this one is uh, that if you look closely at the windows, you can see the photographer sitting in the little um, Morris Mini Minor there. That's probably Frank Corley, um, which, um, by the way, uh, Tyler is a New Zealander. He was born in uh, Dunedin, um, but ended up in Australia. And uh, when I showed the, uh, the, the, there's a story to every one of these photos, of course. When I showed this to the uh, person who lives in that house, who's lived there since the house was built, um, Bill Smith, he's, um, he's about 90, he said, gee, look how clean those windows are. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that, that, that's probably the only time they've ever been clean. But, um, amazingly, Bill was a photographer himself. Uh, he's quite famous um, as an amateur photographer around Queensland. And uh, he, uh, Doug Spowett, who is the reason that Frank um, donated the photos to the library here, uh, developed his first photos downstairs in Bill's darkroom. So um, it, it just amazes me how the, the stories that come from these photos, which is uh, my main interest in using them as a resource to, to gather uh, history. But the, um, where it started from was that our uh, small local history group only founded back in about 2013 and we were looking for ways of engaging the community and uh, we were really interested in how we could use these photos to do it. Um, fortunately, um, we were allowed to sit in the John Oxley Library for days on end, snapping the ones in our local area. Um, so that, that was where we began from, but the, the last image that I showed you was one of the digitised collection which has made our life a lot easier um, now. So this, um, there's a, a great story attached to this house. Um, what we uh, have done, there's, I'll talk about various ways that we get people to identify the houses, um, but uh, one of the sessions that we um, were running, someone came up and found this house and said, oh, yeah, and I looked at them they had tears in their eyes and they started telling me the story of how their dad had actually won the mortgage, uh, won the, the contract to, to get this house and then um, wrote this story that was published in the Sunday Mail back in about 19... Uh, no, it was uh, back about 20, 2007. Goodbye old house, two little words, seven letters in the space, F-O-R space S-A-L-E. They stand there on the front lawn of the house you have owned for 54 years, spelling out the story of 67% of your life. The 67% that saw your youth wane and your middle age bloom. The 67% that saw you slide into old age your strength and dexterity slowly ebbing. This was the house you battled for 20 years to pay for, the house where you conceived children, where you dialed for a cab in the middle of the night 
when your wife filled her first labour contractions, where you thought terrifyingly that the taxi would never arrive in time. This was the house where they phoned you from the hospital to tell you of your beautiful babies. This was the house where your children spoke their first words, where they took their first steps, where your wife planted a slip of frangipani that grew into a giant tree snowed every year with gorgeous flowers. There it still stands on the side of the lawn opposite the for sale sign where it insinuated its heady perfume into your bedroom as you slid into sleep on hot summer nights. Now, I won't go on. The story was published um, March the 23rd, 2007, under the byline Kenneth Royal, a pseudonym for Ken Blanche. Ken and his wife Merle purchased 93 Lang Street, Fairfield in 1953. The address was changed to 19, in 1958 to 37 Mild May Street. In early 2016, developers demolished the house and replaced it with seven two-bedroom units called 37 on Mild May. Um, and Ken, uh, the reason that the house, an unusual um, way to purchase the house, um, the people who had built it were um, newly married, um, but then separated. And uh, the mortgage lapsed, so the Bank of New South Wales had this house that they didn't know what to do with, so they, um, they put up a competition, write a thousand words why you should have this house. And uh, Ken Blanche's essay, which I haven't been able to retrieve yet, um, won the competition, and uh, so they got the, they got the house. Ken, is, uh, his name might be familiar to you. He worked for a long time for Telegraph and Sunday Mail, I think, and um, as, uh, there's lots of uh, publications um, that would be in the library here of his. Um, and he's still alive to my knowledge. Um, uh, so anyhow, that's, th that's really the end point of where we end up with, trying to attach the, find these stories that um, attach to these houses. Um, but the project really started from the, the us wanting to just engage the community and seeing that if we had these photos and asked people if they could identify them, that it was a good way to start. So we began with uh, getting some publicity. Um, we were lucky enough that it got picked up on uh, radio and newspapers. Uh, we also leafleted through the local suburbs and started with um, I think initially I had about a dozen people and um, Kate was one of the pe people who I met right at the very start when we started to do this. And um, so um, we then, well Kate will talk through the identifying um, photos but we have then ended up with once we've got the addresses uh, or we have various meetings along the point where we invi invite the local community. We get loads of people coming along, like Tara here who found out her house in Maruka. Um, and I mean, the, there's millions of, of uses for uh, a photo like that. Um, she said, well, we're renovating the house. We're wondering what it, what it looked like. Yeah, here's the answer. Um, so uh, it's got application and um, in our area, uh, kind of the inner south side, there's lots of changes happening. So um, fortunately, there's lots of people like Tara who are coming through and wanting to preserve the houses that are there. Um, and uh, th this is another one just of a, uh, um, a meeting with, we got about 150 people to a meeting in Clifton Hill. Um, to look at the photos that we'd done in that area. Um, there's a whole story to finding those photos, but I might hand over to Kate now to talk a little bit about what volunteers, um, what, what it's been like volunteering on the project, uh, but also Kate's um, uh, bit of history is Clifton Hill, so um, she's attached to this as well. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate Dyson. I'm the secretary of the Annalee Stevens History Group, as well as a school teacher and um, sort of amateur historian, like 
I have an interest, as Dennis says, in my local area of Clifton Hill. Um, I first got involved in the Annalise Stevens History Group through hearing Dennis actually on the ABC radio talking about all these photos that needed identifying and I thought that would be a great way to get involved in history formally because I hadn't really joined any groups. I went along to a walk that um, Dennis and the um, group had organised. We were split up into groups given these um, pages with little thumbnails on them and given the task of in our groups having a go at trying to identify where the houses were in the um, area between Annerley and Fairfield. And so we went up and down the hills and had arguments and discussions about whether this house was that house and you know there were huge gaps as well where there were modern places and it was all very exciting and interesting to see a snapshot of what Brisbane looked like in the 1970s. Um, we're, it, the story of Frank driving around in his Cadillac meant that um, trying to identify the houses was a bit tricky. There were about 50 pictures or so on each reel, but he had a huge Cadillac. He was driving with his knees, taking photos. <laughs> so um, he went down one side and then he'd turn and it would be the easiest turn that he could make. So it's not all um, set out um, photo after photo. You can go around a corner and sometimes he, he was a bit random in how he named suburbs. So you might have a reel that you think is in Annerley but it's actually in Tarragindi. Um, and then when he'd finished, I like the idea that his wife Eunice, because they were in the business together, was um, developing these photos in a caravan nearby. So then they would, and then they would have salespeople who would go door to door. So it's, it's the lovely story of a, a little business, but we have all these fantastic photos and the stories that come from them are amazing. It's tricky because, as I say, there's gaps. Um, Google Street View is a great tool, even just going back the few years that you can go back on there. Um, you can see the differences. There are houses that I identified when I went round with my pieces of paper and my two dogs and um, trying to write down houses um, that have gone now. So they have been, the photos have been identified, but if you go now to that place, they're gone. So um, my particular area is Clifton Hill in Maruka. Uh, it's a war service, World War I war services home, um, estate. And we, I was able to, um, with Dennis, some of the houses, um, I had an interest, so I came in and photographed some. And then we were be able to identify the houses. Um, we would also had to work out whether they were existing, altered, very altered. Um, there's none on there, but removed or demolished was the other category. Luckily for me in Clifton Hill, we... Um, we're protected by the um, Maruka Stevens um, neighbourhood plan by the Brisbane City Council because it's a war services estate. So there's no, uh, apart from a couple of houses that have um, been removed through fire and damage, um, it, they all exist. But in other places, there's a lot of change. So we pr then recorded our information onto a spreadsheet. The spreadsheets um, we gave back to Dennis. Uh, he worked them out. They're, they're on the Annalise Stevens History um, Group website for our area. And we've worked in phases to go through that. Um, so now I work on the history of Clifton Hill. I've got a collection of 45 houses in the 1970s, which was before they were very altered because now um, there's extensions and carports out the front. Mm -hmm. Everything's changed. But we have that little snapshot of ha World War I houses um, as they were. So I will hand back to Dennis now, unless you want me to say anything else about being a volunteer. There's, there's all sorts of... You get stories, you're able to pass on information. Um, able, we, we've done walks with... Um, people and gathered a, 
lots and lots of stories. Not the big stories, maybe, but the, the stories of how people lived. And everyone loves their homes. They all want to see their homes. Mm. Yeah, don't go away, Kate, because uh, we might throw it open to, to questions. Um, just w w We're just putting that around, which has got um, the links to our um, website, which enable people to find out whether their house is in the collection in the suburbs that we've done. Um, we've done the six suburbs based around Annerley, basically. Um, and then you can access the spreadsheets um, there that, that will tell you um, yeah, if your house is there and where it is in the collection. Uh, so at some point in time when the collection is, is um, online, people will be able to, to go straight to it. But at the moment they can come in and find it in the John Oxley Library. Um, but please ask me some questions and Kate and uh, we'll uh, do our best to answer them. I'll just leave you with this last um, one here because this is my favourite story of the moment. Um, 20 Lyle Street, Tarragindi. Um, the people who live here, Alex and Edith Romov, um, Alex was born in the Ukraine uh, 1924. Um, so he's 94 this year. He's still driving. Um, times were tough when he grew up in the Ukraine. Um, by 1942, he was enlisted in the Red Army. He fought in the Battle of Leningrad, was the only person to survive from his unit when a shell exploded on top of them. Um, he spent the war in prisoner of war camps um, through Germany, ended up in Denmark at the end of the war, um, then had about seven years of going in and out of jails in Denmark and Sweden and Germany as he tried to elude being sent back to Russia because he feared for his life if he was sent back as a soldier that had been captured. Um, finally came, uh, married, met Edith in Germany. They came to Australia. They built that house brick by brick. Um, he, he said, he's only a very small man, he said he didn't think he could build a, a wooden house, that the wood was too heavy, but he could lift one brick at a time. Um, his next door neighbour was a bricklayer uh, who spoke a bit of German, German John Eam. Um, John taught him how to lay bricks. He built this house in Tarragindi in 1950, by about 1956, they were living in the house. Um, they're still there today. Um, Alex has written his life story. It's incredibly compelling um, and it's in the John Oxley Library. So um, it's, I, I'm just amazed that um, I found the story of this house and what I like the most is the uh, sculpture in the front yard. Um, that's been replaced by one of his later sculptures. He, uh, he builds all these wonderful concrete um, uh, sculptures and his backyard is covered in them um, in amongst all the bromeliads. Um, but you know, to me that's you know, a wonderful story of uh, migration to this country that's still going on and, um, and it's really worth preserving and you know, we wouldn't have known about it um, except that you know, there's his house and we found the story out and uh, I hope that you know, that story gets preserved with whatever the legacy of this project is. Dennis, are these photos you've used online or are they still only no. in boxes? They're still only in boxes, a apart from the few that are, you know, there's like a hundred or, or so online, just particular ones. But that, no, these ones are, are not from... Uh, the ones that were selected to go online were the ones that people... That had a bit of architectural significance to them or um, that, that represented particular ar architectural types. Um, yeah, I, I should uh, just say where, where the project's heading, um, well, it's just, we'll finish off the area that we're working through um, and then we're just, uh, we're collating 
as we go. We've had a number of reports which are here in the John Oxley Library. Um, I'll leave them around for you to, to look at in the break time. Um, where we'll end up at some stage, hopefully, with a publication about more about what we've done. Um, but that's a, a few years down the track. Um, the other thing that the, the group's doing, where um, we had a conference that started last year and that the Stories of Stevens was the outcome of that. That's in the John Oxley Library. And we've got another conference coming up February next year. Um, yeah. So, thank you, Anne. Thank you.